to like share this because you might just have to share the link on the Upstate page. I don't know. So we are live, I believe, Marty. We're live. We are live. So uh, let me make sure. Let me just check my, yep. So we're live on my Flip for Freedom page, Marty. Um, so I can share this to, let's see here, more options, share to a page. You might have to share it. To the upstate group? Yeah. Cool. Share to a group. Oh, here we go. Now I got it. Thank you. Upstate. Uh, All right, come on, talk, talk to the peoples, Marty. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you see me? Yeah. Give Are we in this? Are we doing it? Some motivational speeches here. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in on my Facebook uh, channel, Upstate Real Estate Investors. You can All find right, all so those. If you want to check that page, it should be, um, we're live. Yeah, we're live on the page now. Sweet. Cool. Um, think I should share it on the Coffee Club page? Yeah. All right, cool. So give me like two seconds. Share it on the Coffee Club page. No one's doing anything today. They can all be watching this. <laughs> uh share to a group uh sorry coffee club. oh why is that not working there we go your hair is perfect today i you know i took an extra hour to do it today <laughs> <laughs> Only this. an hour? Wow. You did no, it takes five minutes. Good for you. I should have copied and pasted that from your page. Well, like I, you know, like I said, typically people will fast forward about three, four minutes because yeah. it, <laughs> it's just this. Making sure it's all kosher on all the different channels. All right, sweet. Let's rock and roll, baby. All right. All right, so let me get the Zoom back open. Open this up. Marty, pumped to have you on the show today, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, brother. Is definitely inspirational, and I can't wait to just share. Um, one of the things we were just talking about was actually leaving a six-figure job, and I think like a six-figure like payday bonus that you walked away from to be full-time in real estate, which is dope. You know. You either love it or you don't love what you're doing. And at some point, you uh, you realize that it's just not going to take you where you want to be. So it's I love I loved I loved the career. I learned a ton, but it uh, you know, it was just time for me to kind of figure it out on my own. Awesome, man. I, I love that. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later on in the show. But for people who don't know you, Marty, um, can you give them a little background of like, you know, where you started, like, what were you doing before you got into real estate? Yeah. So I uh, was a salesperson at uh, a company in Rochester, CGI communications. And, and we sold over the phone. So a lot of it was over the phone sales. So I was able to really hone my communications craft uh, over the phone closing. You know, we were selling five, 10, $20,000 products over the phone that we would really close on, you know, one call closes, right? So I, I enjoyed it. It was a thrill. I did that for about uh, eight years. I built up a giant book of business. Um, and, uh, you know, as you're in sales, you start to certainly make commission and uh, you don't really necessarily know what to do with it. 
and you, instead of blowing at the bars uh, and just frivolous items, you start to think about what, what can this do to, so that I don't have to, like in sales, start from zero every month, right? How can I figure out a way to have this build something for me? So my partner, Matt, who's still my partner, he's like literally the biggest part of the company, you know, if, I could probably go and, you know, it'd be fine. It would be running and better. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but me and Matt McGuckin, we bought a house and uh, that was it. That was kind of like, we got one, we got addicted to the rent. We got addicted just to finding deals. Cause we're kind of sell, like I said, we're sales guys. So we're just addicted to the hustle on finding a deal and, you know, 60 plus units later and a, bunch of flips later and you know it's just it's been a great ride so far so good dude so what was going through your mind when let's let's forget about real estate for a second but when you started actually making um because you're making really good money at your job like you're making close to six figures or maybe even pushing six figures like what was going through your mind when you started make, making that kind of money and did you ever think that you would give that up when i started making real money in sales yeah. in my yeah. company i dude i started and the CEO is like, there's a guy right there. I was like in this class of new hires and he was pointing to like a vice president and he's like, this guy makes a hundred grand. And I was like, hundred grand, what? And, uh, you know, I was cool with that for being after college. Like I was like, all right, if I could just make like 50 grand, like things would be pretty crazy for me. Like I'd be good. And, uh, and I was like, okay, so what do I got to do to make a hundred grand? He's like, well, you just, you make a hundred dollars a day and you know, you, you, you become an executive and you work at it. And he's like, you should be an executive in, you know, six months. And he goes, if you're fast tracked and I was like, okay. So I was like, all right, well, if I got to make a hundred thousand, okay, if a guy makes a hundred grand and makes a hundred dollars, I'll just make $400 a day. <clears throat> I'll see where I land. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I was a wrestler. I was a rugby player. So I was like, I, I know I cannot work anybody. So that's what we did. That's what I did. I just wouldn't stop calling. I, I, I called during lunch. I called late after work. I mean, my base salary was like $25,000. You know, that was base. That was it. You know, and then there was commission. So you're making nothing. So you had to sell. But uh, all of a sudden you keep your head down and then you make your first sale before six months. I made my first sale before the six month mark and uh, you know, the rest was history. So it was, uh, it happened very quickly and, and I'm grateful that I was able to be in a position at a company that had just started like the startup, which was, I was in uh, a lot of things aligned for me. So it worked out. You know, I love how you said that, you know, I'm not the smartest person, but I can outwork anyone. I love that. So for those of you listening, uh, I think one of the biggest limiting factors for me or limiting beliefs was like, wow, everyone's so smart. Like these people have to be smart, but hard work are always outbeats talent. Like you will always outwork someone um, if you consistently put in the time and work. I was listening to who, who's the Michael Jordan's coach. I, I can't remember what his name was, but I was listening to him do an interview. Are you watching him on Valuetainment? I was watching him on uh, the Lewis Howe show. Okay. Well, Lewis Howes was asking him, like, who was the most talented person? And I, they didn't, he didn't say any names, but he was like, there's this guy that was just so talented, but he was never successful because he only relied on talent and everyone else outworked him to be successful. And uh, yeah, that was a great, that coach, his mental coach, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jordan basically wanted that just for the tiny little edge that he might be able to get on the Barclays, or, you know, and the, uh, you know, the Larry birds of the world. He just wanted that tiny little edge. And that's why he had him as a mental coach. He was like one of the first like mental strength coaches. Uh, Jordan kind of, you know, took that on. And then he was with Kobe and a bunch of other people, but yeah, that was, that was very interesting. I liked, I enjoyed that guy. Yeah, man. It was, it was a great interview. Um, yeah. Sometimes God, I, I look back in high school and college, like I did good. I did. I got great, good grades in high school, but in college there were a lot of classes I've suffered with and or suffered it through rather. And I'm like, I don't know if you went through this, but I always thought to myself, well, I'm never going to be smart enough. Like, how do I be, be successful? So for you guys listening, like you don't have to be very smart, but if you outwork someone and you can consistently do one or two things, like Marty was just hammering the phones and he, made, he started making a six figure salary. So yeah, but you know what, you know what it is? It's, it's, I didn't really care what I was doing. I just wanted to be successful. Like you could have put yeah. me at Verizon. I would have been, I would have just tried to like figure out a way 
you know, I could have been at a car dealership and I would have been selling cars. Like I'll just figure out a way, like who's doing really well. I'm just going to like watch what they're doing. It's a, you know what I mean? Like I didn't really, I didn't necessarily enjoy what I was selling. Like I, yeah. I, I saw there was a benefit to it. Like if you belief in the product and you have a belief in the company and you have a belief in yourself, I think that you can be literally unstoppable, but I only need one of those things. And it was just, you know, you kind of got to, I was lucky. Like I said, I was, I wrestled. So I, I knew like going through like hard times and like losing and then like getting up and like winning. And like, I, I knew that like, there's uh, you know, I was, I, I was able to be mentally tough and conditioned to like, just get back up and keep going, even though I got punched in the face or whatever, or lost a tough match. Cause it's all one-on-one. -on -one. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one sports. I played tennis. It was all, you know, that was one-on-one. -on -one. So like I would, I'm, I'm, I, I can face adversity. Sales is adversity. You're going to get a lot of no's. Real estate's a lot of adversity. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of uh, punches in the face. You're going to get a lot of things going wrong. Rent's not being paid. Tenants kick a hole in the door, whatever. But it's just like, okay, good. Let's go. Let's keep it moving. What do we got to do to get this done and move on to the next, you know, problem and to solve it, right? That's what it's about. It's problem solving. But yeah, it, it, um, it, it does, uh, it is a great, sales is a great career because it, it helps you kind of do anything else you want to do. Like if you can be good in sales or if you're capable, you really can do anything else. You, it, it's a great, uh, it's a great career. I would, I totally agree with that. I didn't start doing any sales training until about a year ago. Um, the very little that I did, I, I took to John Martinez, uh, the online, online class. I'd love to go to a boot camp, but that was, exp it was expensive enough. Um, for the online, but I, everyone, anyone who wants to get in real estate, I would suggest get a sales job first. That sales training taught me more than I have learned in almost my entire life on how people think and feel and make decisions. And it was a game changer for me. So you had eight years of that sales training um, to bring into real estate, which, which I'm going to say gave you a huge competitive edge, even over a lot of people who have been doing this a lot longer than you. Do you, do you see it? Do you see that correlation of leaving? No doubt. No doubt. We're, I, I don't mean to beat my chest, but I'll go toe to toe with anybody just in regards to like, I'll cold call to like, to like, uh, you know, my learning curve can be in three weeks instead of a year because I'm talking to the people. Like I'm actually talking to the owners of like a mobile home park or of an apartment building. So I'm learning the lingo and like they're hanging up on me and it's like, okay, but I, I learned not to say this, but yeah. I learned that this is a problem for a lot of people, right? And so you can curb your learn, you can curb your learning curve quickly by cold calling and just kind of hearing how they talk and, 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 then, and then taking that conversation to the next call and say, you know what, Mr. Seller, that's so funny because I just talked to Larry at Larry's mobile home park. He had the same problem. He's yeah. kind of getting a little older and he was thinking about selling. And I know that your cap rates X, Y, Z, da, da, da. Is that about right for you? Yeah. Okay. And then all of a sudden things are starting to move along quicker because you were, you've had, you have the stories. That That's awesome, man. So what, for everyone listening out there, I know there's a lot of newbies on your upstate page, by the way, if you're not on the upstate, what is the, what is the group page again? The, uh, the first our, yeah, the Facebook group is uh, Upstate New York Real Estate Investors. Yeah, guys. So if you're not on that page, check it out. There's a lot of people from Rochester, Albany, Syracuse, New York City, all over Upstate. So it's a great page. We're actually live streaming there there right now. I just wanted to wanted to plug that real quickly. Um, so Marty, what what like no someone they want to get started in real estate. They know nothing about real estate. Um, what is the one thing that someone needs? just to be successful in general. And that doesn't necessarily have to be in real estate, but what is the one thing that a person needs to be successful? You just gotta have, have, you have to have grit. You just gotta have grit. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting punched in the face and then curling up in a ball for, for a little bit, but you gotta get back up. You gotta, you gotta kind of just go, okay, like it's gonna be okay. You know, we all, cause we all curl up. We all curl up, but yeah, you just gotta have, you gotta have grit and just know that all right, it's not the end of the world. I'm breathing, you know. I I can take the next step forward. If you can just have a, if you can have grit and uh, and resilience, and that's again, you know, if you played a sport, you learn a lot of that. Uh, even if you're just like in in a band, or if you played a musical instrument, you you probably have gotten 
some resilience or people go, Hey, you're not good enough. And then you keep practicing and you get better. It's all yeah. of that. So it's just, it's just, it's, it's a, uh, you kind of got to look like a fool in the beginning to become a master, right? You got to look foolish. You got to ask dumb questions, right? And they are dumb because they just, you know, you just got to learn that you got to just kind of be around people who are better than you and, and have done more than you. And that's fine. Be around those people, but it's like a long process. You know, it's, it's yeah. just a long process. If that's all it's, nothing to be ashamed of everybody. Like I said, everybody who starts anything is going to look foolish. So as long as you're okay with that and you, you know, you're, you're willing to accept that you're going to be a, a newbie beginner, then you'll be fine. Cause that, because if you do that, the people that are, are advanced professionals, you know, full-time people who made a career of this, they'll be willing to help you out a lot more. If you're, if you're like humble and, uh, and willing to listen and, and willing to re realize that you're brand new and you don't know anything and you don't know everything. I'm more, way more willing to pick you up and, and, yep. and school you a bit rather than if you're like, no, no, I know Marty. No, no, I know. I know. I know. And there's a lot of no, no, I know people. And yep. uh, those people are, those people are the worst. They're never going to figure it out. Dude, that that's great advice. I, I, the one word that kept popping in my mind is just mindset over and over again. Like the one thing that I've seen is like, all you need is the correct mindset. How, were you born like that? Like, how did you, how did you create that resilience? Is that something that was like part of you or do you think it just really came from sports? Sports. I mean, it's just being placed in uncomfortable situations. Like I've always been in, like, I used to go when I was a little kid, like, um, uh, I was always going to soccer camps and I was like alone. I was with like four, my brother's four years older than me. So like he had his own group. And so I had to make my own friends. Uh, so I, like, I was always just like making my own friends and like being uncomfortable, like going to like overnight camps, uh, wrestling camps, like where you're by yourself. There's nobody from your school there. And, and you're just trying to figure it out. And like, you're just trying to, you know, you, you pay attention. You're better at that. Uh, but I was always okay with being uncomfortable because I was yeah. like, oh, okay, like it's not a big deal. Uh, but it, it definitely helped just like being put in uncomfortable positions. I mean, I, I you know, in wrestling, you don't, you don't, um, you don't always get to eat and drink, right? You got to make weight. So like this stuff, I mean, compared to that, <laughs> you know, that's not that difficult. Yeah. So, and that's, not normal right but that's i guess an unfair advantage i have is that like i i cut a ton of weight i, I was able to go in the sauna after you know i ran and after a practice where i was still three pounds overweight and i was already sucked out you know trying to make 112 as a ninth grader and then going in the sauna and then sweating out nothing and then you know, waiting the whole night not to eat, to wake up, to take the bus ride from Rochester to Buffalo and putting my head out the window because I needed air because oh it was so God. hot and it was so sick and making weight. So like, you know, that's, that's <laughs> stuff that we did. And it's to a wrestler, that's not crazy, but to anybody else, that's effing nuts. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. Cause I think the, the, if anyone, if you could take anything out of that is just like, try to find ways to make yourself uncomfortable. And I think I don't know if it was going back to like Jordan and Kobe, like they don't run from their challenges. They're like, okay, this is going to make me uncomfortable. Like I'm going to kill this thing. Like I'm going to face this thing head on and, and take it on no matter how stupid I look or no matter how difficult, difficult it is. But as soon as you let those fears and doubts creep in game, it's game over. Like that's why mindset is so, so crucial here when you're trying to be uncomfortable. It's like, I don't remember who I was talking to. Um, but I, another podcast I was listening to, the guy was like, unless you're like going into something willing to like die trying, like just, you might as well just give up now. That's the mindset you have to have. Like no matter what it takes, you're going to figure it out. Like it doesn't matter what gets thrown across your path. Like, yeah, maybe you got to drop 10, 20, 30 pounds or whatever it is in the, in, in the world of wrestling. But in the world of real estate, it could be like your first flip, you fail. So how are you going yeah. to look, look at that? Well, the other thing is like, I don't, I, the other thing is like, I know that my parents are always going to love me. Like I, I know my wife's going to still love me. Like I know my friends still love me, like no matter what. So it's like, okay, like I'll just go in and go hard. You know, I'm not going to die from this, you know, like, uh, you know, and also less people have done, you know, less people of less circumstances and people who are, are uh, less motivated and less have done it. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like people come to the country with a, like a penny in their pocket and they make it. So it's like, I don't have an excuse. That's awesome, man. Let's, let's switch gears here real quick. Cause I want to hear about the moments when you decided to transition into real estate first time where maybe you thought to yourself, and maybe this never happened, but did you ever think to yourself, did I make the right decision to do this? Full time? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, you know, when we, there's doubts, but you realize like, what's my why, right? My why is to, you know, have my freedom, but it's not just that it's, I want to be able to prove, you know, that I can do this, right? It's, I do, my biggest fear is failure probably. And, uh, you know, it's just to say like, Hey, I can do this. I like, I can, I enjoy accomplishing things that were just in my brain. And then all of a sudden I see it done. Right. That's amazing to me. Like that's, that's what gets me going. Hmm. Um, but I, I've, I've had that thought a number of times and it's totally normal, uh, especially when you're, but I just knew, I just knew like I hit my level at my company. I wasn't really going to be, um, they weren't going to make me an owner. They weren't going to like make me partner or nothing like that. And so then what am I doing it for? I'm, I'm just going to like yeah. keep selling for somebody else. I didn't want to work at another company. Right. And I knew I had, I believed I knew I had what it took to start my own. Oh, by the way, I had a freaking same kind of guy like me with me in the trenches and Matt McGuckin. So yeah. that's a guy that I, you know, I'll, I'd go down the ship with. Oh yeah. Um, I think that's a huge part of our success is just, is having a partner that's also just as jacked up, if not more juiced up than me and just has just as big as goals as me. Um, I know partnerships are really tough. They typically are, you know, just like marriages, they're probably about yeah. 50% or if less. For sure. Uh, but, For sure. but I think if you have the same values as your partner, you might not have the same likes, but if you have the same values, then it's going to work out. Like I just talked to him on the phone today and we were talking about a project where he's like, you know, I don't know, you know, this is going to be a really tough. I go, I don't care then. Don't let's not do it. Like, I don't want him to go through that. I don't want yeah. him to have any pain that, cause he has a different pain than me. Cause he's dealing with a different division and I have a different division of the company. And I was like, it's not worth your, I don't care how much money we're going to make. It's not worth your mental. And I truly feel that way. Like I really want him to That's be awesome. Yeah, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I, I need him. I need him for the long haul. Yeah. I don't need him to be burned out after a year, like, you know, five years. I need him for 30 years. This is a marriage. So uh, anyway, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, like I said, things worked out and I, I'm very lucky and I'm grateful. You just brought up a really good point. Uh, my, my old coach, Stephen Cook, one of the things he told me that's res resonated with me heavily was like, you can always make more money, but you can't get back time. Yeah. Yeah. People absolutely. come into real estate like, I'm going to make all this money. And you just hit the nail on the head. You're like, I want to be out. You're like 30 years. Like I'm in this for the long haul. And I think a lot of people lose sight of what it takes to become wealthy in real estate. It requires a significant amount of time. Like you can make really good money now, but that's nothing compared to what I think you and I want to work toward is building like long-term sustainable wealth. And that takes years and years, 10, 15, 20, 20 years. I mean, um, so I think it's really cool that you can look at those projects and say, yeah, we can make a shit ton of money, but what's more important is our time and our health and let's figure something else out. Maybe go a different route. I love that you guys have the ability to do that. Cause I think it's super critical in, in any partnership. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. You got, you got to be honest with each other. So what were some of the moments where you did have those doubts? Like get specific. Was it on a flip? Was it just certain timing in your life? You might've been going through something like, what were some of those nitty gritty moments you were like, oh man, this, this sucks. Maybe I made the wrong <laughs> thing. Give us some specific details. All right. So there's, there's still days where we want to just sell our whole package of, you know, houses, you know? Yeah. <laughs> there's still those days. Uh, the truth is, is that always the negative seems that way the outweigh the positive. So what, so, a, so a specific, um, you know, we have four properties that haven't paid rent in a year and, you know, three, four months. Right. So that's a 55, $60,000 nut that typically is in our coffers that we yeah. don't 
now have. That's that's difficult. Uh, but on the flip side, the flips are going insane right now because yeah. it's just you know, so that balances it out. Uh, moment where I was like, I don't know if this is going to work out. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll have that moment, then then I'll, then me and Matt will talk, and I'm like, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna be fine. It's gonna work out. Uh, I try to I try to after I read the book uh, Think and Grow Rich, I really try to take fear out of my head, man. I think it's always going to work out. I truly believe that. I truly am an optimistic guy. Like I just, I know it's going to work out. I know if you truly care and you wake up and you try every day, try to chisel at it and you can't, how, you know, you know what it takes to, you know what it takes to eat an elephant, Brett? A lot of people. <laughs> one bite at a time. Yeah. It's just one bite at a time. And that's a model that Matt and I have. What does it yeah. take to eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. And, you know, you don't go crazy and you, you, you just, you just try to day by day, chisel at it, chisel at it. And, uh, that's to be honest, I can't remember a time where we've been like, holy crap, we're screwed. Other than the time when we first bought our first house. <laughs> and I can get into that story, but <laughs> I've said it a bunch of times. I don't know if we have time for that, but give us like, a, give us like the elevator pitch and like. So 30. basically we're buying the property the day of closing. We thought we could get a mortgage on it. And obviously we're so stupid. We didn't even know that you, you know, you have to set these things up for the day of closing. Right? <laughs> but we get to closing. It's a tax foreclosure. And we're like, yeah, we're just, you know, we're trying to get a, a mortgage on it. He's like, you can't get a mortgage on a tax foreclosure. You got to pay cash. That's what my attorney said. So long story short, we had to come up with the money that day, you know, the day before the closing. And, uh, you know, it was all the money I had in my account. It was all the money Matt had in his account. And we made it work. To me, that's a win. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> so, so for those of you listening, um, don't ever buy a property at tax foreclosure and try to, and try to get a mortgage on it. Lesson, lesson learned. That's a good lesson to learn. The and lesson learned. It's awesome to hear, like, you can humbly share that. And, like, not oh my ever. God. Yeah. And there's a lot of those. There's a lot of, like, just punches to the face and gut that uh, <laughs> I don't really, we got to, like, go back into the archives. And I'd be happy to explain them to you. But at this point, I'm just, I'm, pat, you know, it's just, I can't think about that stuff. <laughs> so, would, would you say that your relationships have heavily influenced your mindset to, to continually, like, be chipping away and, and have the right mindset? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you surround yourself with people who've done it. You surround yourself with people who are like-minded. You know, you're, I truly believe your net, your network is your net worth. So I, and I try to always be looking at stuff that's motivating, right? Like on my yeah. Instagram, I only have like just top level stuff. Like I don't, I don't, I don't look at the news. I don't care about what's, you know, that the, 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 the this and that I'm just always trying to think about like I'm always trying to look at stuff that's like motivating to me. Uh, so I, I really try to have a diet on what I put in my, you know, in my, in my peripherals. I just try to keep it really just goals, how to like, you know, reach the, the level I'm looking to reach. And I follow the people who are already there. So it's, that's, that's what I try to do continuously. By the way, I love your videos, the live videos that you do. Um, love. Them. Thanks man. Those are true. Like I got that. Those are true stuff. It's just true stuff. I'm amped up. I'm an amped up guy it, to a fault. You know, it's good and bad. Certainly. Uh, there's people who are turned off by, uh, you yeah. know, the, the amped upness. It's just who I am. I get amped up. I like getting people riled up and motivated and trying to tackle their goals because I think there's just a lot of people who are on snooze. They're just zombie walking through life and you just got to take a snap out of it and get going. Um, and I'm one of those guys, I need to get amped up. That's why I continuously yeah. watch stuff and continuously, you know, I do my workouts and I do my morning routine so that I can, uh, practice what I preach because yeah, right. I can, I can, I can, and I'm constantly having to do these things so that my energy levels are, are high and that, uh, you know, again, I can practice what I preach. I, I really do this stuff. I mean, we really do flip houses. I mean, we really do buy every day. I mean, we really do, uh, the work. So it's, I don't have anything to, I, and at the same time, I have nothing to prove to anybody because I'm doing it. So it's like, come and look at it. It's, it's right, right here. Love it, man. Awesome. So before we dive into short sales, the, the next like 20, 30 minutes, uh, I know I sent out some notifications like, 
you've been, it sounds like you've been getting a lot more leads in short sales. I've been getting a lot more leads lately um, for the short sales. And I think it's critical to inform anyone interested in um, getting started in real estate, what that process looks like, because um, you can put both yourself and the seller at harm's risk if you don't know what you're walking into. And I think those are the things that we're going to talk about here briefly. But who who are some other like influencers or people in your network that um, that have just that are the most impactful on you? Uh, friends, family, and uh, I'm just just curious to share those with people because for anyone maybe looking to extend their network or build out a network, you know, where can they find these people? I uh, Patrick David is uh, someone that I follow and listen to, you know, pretty religiously uh, on business and kind of uh, in life. Joe Rogan is someone I listen to, uh, but. Uh, bigger pockets was a, was really what got me started in real estate. So, you know, and, and really I follow a lot of the, the people that were on the podcast uh, maybe four or five years ago. I'm not really so much listening to it right now heavily just because I feel like I'm in it. I need other things. I need more business stuff rather than real estate uh, stuff. But locally, I mean, Brett, you were a guy that I still, you know, look at as a, as a guy who does a lot of great stuff with marketing and, uh, you know, just, you're always on the cusp of new stuff that is, uh, is interesting with video. And, um, I, I think it's awesome what you're doing with your podcast and, and all that. So I appreciate you having me on and, uh, you know, like Matt Druin. I mean, I remember, you know, those guys, these guys are top level dogs, you know what I mean? And Matt Druin and there's a bunch of other people, but, uh, those are kind of like the local people you look up to and, you know, Matt's doing a lot of great stuff with like social, in the social justice world that I'd like to be able to help out with at some point, but he, you know, he's got his hundred plus properties that, <laughs> that are on park Ave and, and whatnot. So, you know, he, but he built that he's doing a great job. So yeah, I, but I follow uh, Patrick, Beth, David, I like Brad Lee, L E A. I think he's okay. a, I think he's a G um, he's like a Grant Cardone, but like way more humble. So I like him okay. a lot. He's got a, he's got a thing called dropping bombs podcast. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, David Goggins. So I watch his stuff. He's a, a Marine. He was a Marine okay. group in Buffalo. And, uh, he, he's got a great book. Um, his pod, he, he doesn't have a podcast, but he had a great book and I listened to it and it's just, he was on Rogan and a bunch of other people. And so just inspirational stuff, anything that can get me inspired. I love. Hell yeah. Love it. All right. So let's, let's dive into the nitty gritty short sales. I don't have any plan for this segment of the podcast, but maybe just share some of some bullets or some lessons that you've learned, or just maybe, maybe there's just some things you want to share in general of, of what you've experienced doing short sales and maybe what some view, listeners out there should really take note of if they're going to pursue a short sale or a property that is in pre foreclosure. Yeah. So I believe we're going to have a lot of these, you know, it's crazy about short sales. And if, if you don't know uh, what a short sale is, essentially the homeowner is going to sell the property short of what's owed or short of the mortgage. So if you have a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar house and it's worth, you know, 90 because it's just uh it, it needs work or maybe it's worth 80 90 because it needs work to get to a hundred thousand dollar house and you have a mortgage on it for a hundred it's not going to work you're not going to be able to sell the property at uh on market you're gonna you know because the seller if they tried to would actually have to come to the table with money for someone to buy it so after realtor fees and attorney fees and you know, fixing it up, it just doesn't work. So what a lot of people do is, unfortunately, what a lot of people actually do is they bury their head in the sand and let the property go to, to auction, yep. which is your worst case scenario. And I always tell sellers, I go, you know, listen, you got a bunch of options, all right? But there's really, truly, there's three that, make the most sense to the seller if they're really thinking about doing a short set or if they're, if they're in foreclosure, right? In foreclosure, 
is a long process. It's not like you miss a payment and then it goes to auction. It's a long process. There's a lot involved. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of letters from the bank, calls from the bank yep. that these people are probably getting. And uh, there's, so there's a, it's a long process. And I always tell the seller, you know, you have three options. And, and normally the sellers I work with, Brett, they don't want to stay in the property. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the options is a loan modification. But I tell them, like, do you want to stay in the property? Because if that's the case, I'm probably not going to be your best fit. Love it. And, uh, and, and, and again, in, in, in our sales, you know, tree, I'm telling them, by the way, we may, this may not be a good fit right at the beginning. You know, and, you know, I really truly believe, hey, I don't buy every house. And I really think you may want to, you know, put a, put a for sale sign in the ground and, and try to, and try to sell this on market. And when they realize that they'd have to come to the table with money, that's out, right? So that's out. Okay. So that's out. Well, then your second choice is, do you want to stay in the house? Do a loan modification. And a loan modification essentially is, is, you know, you're going to tack on what you owe to the back of the loan. And um, there's a lot more to it. They have to be approved by the bank and they have to make sure that, you know, they want to stay there for another, for, for longer than, than the period when they first bought it. So that's usually not what they want to do. And that's okay. The, the third option, again, it, you know, the last option you don't want is to let it go all the way to the bank to, you know, to the auction to be sold at the county footsteps, right? You don't want that at all for that person because that's on your credit for seven years and all the bad yep. things that go with a foreclosure, a straight foreclosure. So what we offer is, uh, is a short sale and I explain it to them. Um, it is pretty like much what I told you. Listen, this is only if you don't want to stay. Do you not want to yeah. stay? No, I don't want to stay. Okay, so what we can do is we can try to get you approved for a short sale. It's not guaranteed. I think okay? that's I important. Yeah. That you communicate that. We can try. Like you have to we communicate can try. that. And I'm going to try my hardest. And the people I work with have a very high approval rating. Yep. Okay. 80-ish percent, 80, 90 percent most times. But it doesn't always happen. And if I can't get it for what I need to get it as an investor, it's not also going to work out. Yep. So I really let them know all their options. But the truth is, there's not a lot of options when they're in that situation. So, but what I like to give them is I am your best way out. Uh, I am, uh, I'm going to be working with you the entire time. I'm going to make it as simple as I possibly can for you. And uh, I, I'm going to really try to do the work that, that you don't want to do to get it to happen, right? So working with my team, having my agents in place, having my attorneys in place that they know this better than me, right? Yep. They know that way better than me. This is what they do for a living. So I try to, what I like to do is just be a conveyor belt to get them from my initial contact into their hands. Cause I know yeah. they're in better hands with them because they're going to, they're yep. the professionals, they're the realtors and they're the, uh, they're the attorneys that do short sales on a daily basis. So my whole thing is I just want to get you in, let you know that there's a way out and it doesn't have to be a painful process. You can have more control. You can know that no one's just going to knock on your door one day saying, get out. The house has been sold. Right. So we really try to give them a, uh, a better timeline and just a, uh, you know, really be become someone who's out to help them try to figure out if this is the best fit for them. And also we're going to have all the support you need to, to get this done the right way. And in, in, in a way that is um, in a way that's a more, uh, you know, it's humane, I guess. Yeah. yeah more palatable. Like it just makes it a lot less. It, it takes a lot of stress away when a homeowner knows that you care and that one of the analogies that I give us give a seller is like when we sign this contract, like you and I, we're just imagine like us locking arms, like that's us until we get to closing, like we're separated at the hip. You and me, we're a team. We're in the trenches working on this together. And yes. uh, I I kept coming up like the the word kept popping in my mind a few minutes ago was like educator. So it sounds like you're going into this as an educator. You're also saying that this may not work, which I think is awesome because that's what everyone should be saying 
and you're also, um, you have the right team behind you. So you're educating, you're saying you're not the best option, um, but you also have a team that backs you up to actually closes 80, you know, 80 plus percent of these short sales, which is a big component of doing short sales. Like if a real estate agent brings me a short sale outside of Debbie and Warner, I, I honestly say, look, I'm not really interested. I can pay you a, uh, a referral fee or whatever it is, but like, unless these two people do it, I, I can't do it. Cause I don't, you have no track record of being successful. Like I'll walk away from those. I don't, I don't know about you because when I look at that perspective, when I, when I go in to help a seller, I want to know that there's a high percentage that I can actually help them. And I have to use the right people to do that. Yeah. I, to be honest, it doesn't, I let them know, like at any time you can cancel this. Like, I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't, this isn't like life or death for me. Like if to buy this house, like I want to help you, like I will buy it. I, I am a buyer. We're always, this is what we do every day. Right. I let them know, like, you're not alone. This stuff happens literally every day. Anytime someone calls me and like, yeah, you know, I'm behind. I'm like, sure. I go, you are not alone. And typically yeah. we bought a house in a three mile radius of that or five, ten, you know, five mile radius. You know, we have a house next door like in this case we i'm literally on the phone with the lady last yesterday and i bought a house on the same street through a short sale and she yeah. needs to do a short sale so i'm i'm third party storing with her you know mm -hmm. the whole time saying you know what miss mrs seller i get it completely and by the way we do this all the time this yeah. is how we buy properties and i actually just worked with uh mrs jones she was right down the street from you and she goes, you know, Marty, I just got divorced and I don't know what to do. I can't just be paying this by myself and it needs a ton of work and I don't know what to do. And when I explained to her the short sale process, she goes, Marty, thank you so much for helping me. I actually got a hug from her, Mrs. Seller. So when I come and I do the short sale with you and if we do get it approved and it works out, will you be giving me a hug at closing? She goes, yes, Marty. Yes, absolutely. And I know you will. So let's do this. Let's find a time that works for you, me, and my team so we can meet with you, explain it. And after that, if you want to move forward, let's go with it. If not, no big deal. Okay? At least you'll have some better understanding of what we can provide for you. And you go about it that way, you're going to win every time. Dude, I, I'm hearing a lot of the stuff that I learned in the John Martinez. I love, like, you know, we're just one option. Like, even if you say no, it's okay. Like, Saying that to the seller removes so much stress. This is what the process looks like. We're going to educate you. And at the end of that, and the end of that, whatever you want to call it, proposal, whatever it is, you're like, look it, this is ultimately your decision. And it's okay if you say no. So okay. And that so is okay. a huge part of the sales process, even if it's not a short sale. For those of you guys listening, like sellers need to know it's okay to say no. And oftentimes that lowers their guard for you to even negotiate and do more deals. So if you could take anything, as far as negotiating goes, start using that negotiating with the sellers and let them know you're just one option. Educate them and ultimately let them feel like they're making a decision or let they're making a decision at, at the end of that. Um, we'll just call it a proposal. There's a word I'm, I want to use. I just can't think of it right now. So what are some things that, so people just getting started in real estate, what would you say to someone that's like, hey, Marty, I got this person. I think they're going into foreclosure. Like, what should I do? What would you say to that person? I would say... You know, first off, know know what you're know what you're gonna say, and don't try to do this on your own. Uh, I would refer you to somebody. I would certainly don't don't try to like I, this. Took I I probably sat down with people at the table uh, with a, a couple of different agents, maybe 30, 40 times. To, to really understand the lingo and to really understand like, this is somebody's like, you know, this is a serious situation. For yeah, someone. it is. You know, this is somebody, I, you know, nobody bought their house thinking this is what was going to happen. Right. So this, this, is, this wasn't in the cards. Like this wasn't, they didn't know about this and like, this wasn't supposed to happen. Right. So I would really tell them to really think about, First off, are you going to be able to close this deal if you are to go through with this, right? Like if you're going to go through the short sale and it gets approved, are you really going to be able to close it with your money? Yep. And, it, it, you know, so the, there's a lot of little things that unless 
I'll tell you this. This is what I would say. Is this your first time buying a property? I probably wouldn't do a short sale. Tr truthfully, I, I think sit that one out, refer <laughs> it to me or Brett. But no, truthfully, no, but yeah. truthfully, I wouldn't have wanted to do this my first time. No freaking no. way. No, no way. Me. Because the other problem is there's uh, there's no real timeline for you as the buyer, right? Because it could be th it could be literally. Yeah. I think my fastest one was literally two months. It was fast, very fast, and it's never been like that in my life. It was so fast, and the longest one was a year. So, but if it's a year, you better be still in the market, ready to buy, ready to yeah. go. And if it's two months, you better be ready to go. So I don't know if I would have had all my systems in place to be able to just be able to go. Marty, it got approved 30 days to close. And you need that cash because you can't assign a short sale. So you have to close on a short sale. So you have to use your own money to close on that. So that, that's a big thing. Like, and if you have multiple deals going or you have a limited amount of money, like Marty says, you go a year from now and you put that money into a rental property or you bought something else, you don't have that cash on hand. You just literally screwed a, a homeowner uh, you know, now they're going to get foreclosed on if they can't sell that property on the market. You literally just basically threw someone in front of the bus. Well, you screwed three people over. You screwed over the seller, most importantly, right? Yep. The attorney who has been working on this uh, for you and the paralegal probably who has been busting their butt, making the dials to get this done. And third, the agent who is probably a dual agent on it, who is yep. representing you and the seller. So now if you try to do one again and you screwed up the first one, you're going to, they're, they're not going to take it seriously. Nope. And Rochester is small and there are only a few people who specialize in short sales. So if you screw it up once, odds are you, have, you have taken yourself out of the opportunity to do any of those in the future. And that's, that's the truth. So make sure if you're going to do it, do it right. One of the things that I'd love to add is I think it has been critical for me um, and we sort of touched on it was like managing expectations and relationships with the seller, because through this process, if it takes up to a year, you have to get, um, you have to submit paperwork. That seller has to submit paperwork over and over and over and over again. And if you're not coaching them and handholding them and, and consoling them and being empathetic to their situation and being kind and caring, at some point they can just say, I'm tired of this. I want out. I don't want to do this anymore. A year of going through this is not easy for sellers in certain situations. So if you don't know how to coach and manage relationships, this is also probably not the avenue you want to go down. Um, and if you have a deal partner with like, look at guys, Marty and I have a lot of experience. Like sellers can go cold in an instant if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time. So it is critical that you know how to, to manage these relationships with these homeowners. Yeah, I just think uh, I, I definitely wouldn't want it to be my first one. Just like I said, I, I, what if I when I see my first one, I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to be have it my first maybe three or four rentals that I bought. Like it's just not I just wouldn't do it like that. Um, I would want like three or four have a hard money lender, you know, have my lender lined up, yep. make sure it's a property that I know I'm going to buy, and uh, and be willing to take on some of the stuff that goes on with short sales, you know, which is just a long process. It can be painful. There's banks that are going to bust your balloons and you just got to, it's just not something that is a, uh, you know, one-on-one stuff, but, but if it, if you are someone who, listen, I got the money, it's areas I'm, I want to buy in, then make sure you have the right team around you. Cause it, it, it can be very lucrative. And it can be a very great, uh, great way to help somebody who needs help to get out of a property that they don't want. And for you to get into a property for, you know, 50 cents on the dollar. Yeah, I know you've had some really good short sales. Just, um, and just to, maybe if you want to share one of your wins, but the, the house that I'm currently in right now, um, it was a guy and a daughter. Um, he was falling behind on his payments. And he had moved to Webster and he's trying to maintain both properties. I mean, this home was in serious disrepair, but the BPO came in on this house at $23,000. That's um, I could probably sell it today for 170. Um, so talk about a spread. You know, I over renovated it, way over renovated it. I probably put 65,000 into it, but I didn't need to do that. If it was a flip, 
50 would have sufficed to get this thing done. Um, so those are the types of spreads, you know, and I don't know if you want to share one of your wins of what kind of the spreads can look like on, on a short sale. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, that's the other part of it, right? So when you're talking to the seller, you have to let them know, listen, I'm going to be going low when I make my purchase offer on the property, because I'm trying to figure out where the bank needs to come yeah. in. At, right. So don't take this as disrespect on the number I'm putting here. And oh, by the way, I'm already telling them and they already know you're not getting anything and you're the bank's making all the decisions here. What you're getting is you don't have to worry about this property anymore. You, you don't got to worry about fixing this thing anymore. You don't got to worry about, uh, you know, the taxes anymore. You don't got to worry about any of that. The payments you've been making that are going to something that you don't love or want anymore. You know, it could have, it could be a bad memory of your whatever situation you're in anymore. You know, you know that they want to do a short sale when they say, I literally need to get this off my chest, right? When yeah. you see the property on top of them and they, they're like talking about how it's literally on top of them or it's, it's like a pain, you know that they're ready to go on a short sale. Uh, but, you know, we really go as low as we possibly can. I mean, we're, we're making just ridiculously disgusting, gross offers on these properties and they don't always come back yeah. in, but I tell them that, listen, I need to get it for this number. I'm a, I, this is yeah. how I provide for my family. So if I don't get it for this number, it's not going to work for me, but it wouldn't work for me. It wouldn't work for anybody. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of the give and take. And, you know, plenty of times we've bought in, you know, $130,000 houses for, you know, 40, $50,000 and felt really good about it. So let's talk about the price real quick. Cause that's one thing we didn't touch on. So um, when we're writing up the purchase offer contracts, Marty said, you know, we're going as low as possible. Like I, I wrote a contract once I didn't even have a price on it. And the reason for that is because the bank comes in and does a BPO, a broker price option. Did I say that correctly? I feel like I was, yeah. and they're the, the bank is the, it, they put the price on that house. Now there is some wiggle room negotiate there, but you have to go in low on your price because if you go too high, you know, then you're screwing yourself and the bank could have. I mean, lower on their appraisal. So our offers on these, on these properties are really, really low. And there has to be a talk track with the seller. So they understand why your offer is 20,000, why it's not 50 or 60,000. Um, and that's and important. The thing is they don't care. The bank doesn't care. They want to relend money out. They, they don't care about the 60, 70,000. I've actually had three or four situations where they've actually uh, released the mortgage on the property. So wow. the, buy, the, the the homeowner thought there was, you know, a mortgage on it because that's what looked like there was. And then the bank's like, F this house. I don't want it anymore on our, I don't want it on our, on our, our books. I don't want it on our spread, our spreadsheet. So that happens too. Like the banks don't care. And I don't care about the banks. I'm going <laughs> to go low. I'm going to win. Yeah. I'm going to try to win. The banks don't care. They don't care about you. They don't care about me. I mean, look at, look at, uh. What was it? Wells Fargo. They just made like a billion dollars on uh, on overdraft fees. So you just made a billion dollars on somebody who doesn't even have money in their ATM. They don't give a half. A so billion dollars on overdraft fees. That's insane. Yeah, a billion, billion and a half on overdraft fees. So like, who cares? Just go low. The bank doesn't care. They they just want to relend the money out, but they have a certain criteria or number that they have to be at. So they you know they they can't have all these mortgages and, and not be able to relend the money. They just want to keep relending money. Yeah, the banks do not want to take these properties back. No. They want to get these things off their book because they're a headache. They cost them money. They take time and effort. It's a liability. And both of us know that like banks are horrible at taking properties over. They sit, they deteriorate, they don't get dilapidated. And they're usually the ones buying the properties back at auction and holding them. And I don't, I don't understand the, that whole part of the process. I don't but, understand that either. It's a weird uh, man. I'll we'll never get it. Yeah, it. It just doesn't make sense. But you know, there, there's a reason why banks are willing to sell these properties short of what's due on the note, because it costs them way too much money to take them back. So we're going to wrap this up, Marty. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to share on that process that you think is, is critical to anyone who is looking to work with a seller um, on doing a short sale. No, I, I would just, uh, I would say you're going to see a lot of them though. And they're going to be coming up a lot. I mean, to the point where uh, the lady I work with, she indicated to me that we haven't even reached the short sales from the 2008, 2009 crash. Mm. So when this new one comes up, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. And oh, by the way, 
the people that have bought houses the last three, four years that are way overvalued, what about those people? What's going to happen to them? Yeah. It's going to be tough. So learn the strategy or learn how to talk to somebody or whatever. And if you get a lead and you're not sure, send it to me or Brett, uh, I'll walk you through it. And if I think that you, you, if you think that you can do it and you got the team, I, I don't want any part of it. I just, I yeah. tell you if I'm, if I'm interested and you want to JV on it, great. And if not, no big deal. I don't care. Yeah. I, I love it. And they're, um, yeah, fine. For those of you guys listening, find people who do these and do these successfully. There's not, the very many people and there's very few also agents or brokers who also work on short sales. So if you're looking to build a team, um, look at it, like 10, if I could rewind 10 years ago, I would give up, you know, 80, 90% of the profits on a deal for someone to teach me how to do this successfully oh, all no. day long. I do it two or three times until I knew exactly how to do it myself so I can go do it and then make hundred percent of profit. So I'm taking, you know, a year's year's worth of learning curve, and maybe doing it in a year or less to be able to go out and do it on my own and do it right and do it successfully long term. We, we were saying earlier, this is a long term game, right? You need to learn how to do it right. Look at another thing that I learned is like you can make a lot of money in real estate. You can be very transactional, but you won't last. You need to be relational. You need to understand how people how people think, feel, and act, and build relationships. And short sales is the one way you can, where you can be extremely successful and make a crap ton of money. You just need to know the right people. And also help, and also help the seller tremendously, the homeowners tremendously. Exactly, man. Marty, you are awesome, dude. Thanks so much for hopping on the Bye. show. You know, I'm pumped for uh, if you guys aren't uh, part of that Upstate New York page. Um, Marty's going to be doing a bus tour, which I think is freaking awesome. So Marty, I don't know where I got the idea, but man, I'm glad I did. Whoever that guy is, he's, he's awesome. He should probably get to go on that bus tour for free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll be a co-sponsor. No. We'll be at the, be at the um, last house. Yeah, dude. I, I actually want to go on that. Um, and for, for those of you listening who's like, well, why would you want to go on a bus tour? You already know how to do this. It's because like, I'm not Marty and I'm not Matt. They probably do things better than I do. There's always, you need to always just be ready to learn. Be humble, learn. I'll be on that bus. So I'm pumped. And uh, I can't wait to have you. Yeah, Yeah. it's uh, we are meeting with the people today. We got the dates pretty much picked out. We got the website will be coming up there soon so that people can just see what we're going to do, get the itinerary. Uh, We're looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we hope this will be uh, one of many. So So do you know what month right now that you guys plan on? July. Yeah, July. Yeah, end of July, like middle end of July. So we'll. uh, And you're going to take people through how many homes? Uh, four houses. Yes. Yeah, four houses, and that's and that and that is really the most you want to do. That's really the most you want to do. It's it's going to be a long, it's going to be a long day, but it's going to be freaking packed full of just how we do things, what we do, why we do it, and uh, you know how we found them, the marketing that we're using, what we think is going to be the next great marketing tool for our, our for defined properties. That how we find the properties uh how we fund them i mean it's it's going to be it's going to be kind of stupid the way we we kind of give it all away but i don't i don't really care because at the end of the day it's what you do with it and uh, i've always been told that you know you give as much as you can because at some point it comes back around and it always does yeah man i don't think anyone has done anything successfully like that in rochester rochester is so small and i, I don't know why like in, in bigger markets, there's always these, you know, these events that people can go to. Um, and we don't, we don't do a lot of that stuff here. So I'm grateful for you who are getting that, that Facebook group active and going and creating more meetups. We got the coffee club, that meetup's getting started again. COVID kind of sucked the momentum out of that, but I'm just proud yeah. of all the, all the people that I've got to meet over the past five years, like you, you know, Ben, uh, Matt Druin, you know, Harold, there's so many awesome people that guys, if you, if you have the right mindset, I mean, we know, like we have immediate millionaires connected to Marty and I, and like, you can have direct access through them, through us. And all you need to do is have the right mindset. These people will give you their time and give you all the tools you need to be successful. But if you waste their time, they're going to be like, see you later. I don't want to part of you. So just 
you brought it up, man. Be a giver. Be a giver, and that and that value will come back to you. So I appreciate you, Marty. I'm pumped for this nice, bus bro. tour. Thanks, Again. brother. Coming soon. Uh, Thanks, man. So how can people find you on social media, Marty? Yeah, you go to our Facebook group. It's uh, Upstate New York Real Estate Investors. And uh, I'm on there pretty much weekly doing some live videos, talking about what we're doing, showing deals that we're doing, getting people's head out of their butts and trying to, you know, get you some snap out of it pills and, and just, uh, and get, get you going for the week, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, you can find me there. I'm on, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You can call me, you can text me. Nobody ever does. I'm on bigger pockets. So feel free. To, Nobody feel ever free. does. Take them up on that offer. Nobody ever texts Marty. <laughs> Nobody, everyone. I'm going to, I'm going to put his cell phone number when I post <laughs> Post this so you can all call Marty and believe. I don't us. care. That's Down fine. Let's do it. That's awesome, dude. Well, Marty, thanks for hopping on the show today. And for those of you guys tuning into the Flip for Freedom show, I truly appreciate your support. If you have any suggestions or guests or want to be on the show, just let me know. Show me some love and have a blessed day, guys. We'll catch you on the next one. Sweet.